The text for our consideration this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 17. The reading begins at verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. This is the gospel of our Lord, amen. amen. Think of your best friend in the whole world. Who is your best friend? Is your best friend your spouse, one of your siblings, one of your parents, a friend from high school, a friend from college? Think of your best friend in the whole world. How many things do you have in common with your best friend? Do you wear the same kinds of clothing? Do you like the same kind of music? Do you watch the same movies? Do you like the same TV shows? None of those? What do you have in common with your best friend? Consider how close you are with your best friend. If you were locked in a room with that person, how long would it take before they're not your best friend anymore? Would it take an hour, two hours, five minutes? How long would it take before your best friend isn't your best friend anymore when you're locked in a room with them? Nothing on the walls, just, just white walls, no sound, you're just sitting there, two chairs facing one another. How long would it take? Maybe you're not facing each other, maybe you're both facing the same direction, and maybe it's not walls, maybe it's windows of a car as you're driving across the country somewhere this summer. Because, as far as I'm concerned, summer has officially begun. Now it's not, it's not official because, you know, I'm not in charge the calendar, I didn't decide when the summer solstice was. I didn't decide that it was June 21st, so like three weeks from now or whatever. As far as I'm concerned, summer starts on Memorial Day, and this is the time when people start planning road trips, planning vacations, going somewhere with their best friend. Maybe they're going camping, driving to a hotel somewhere. They're going on a trip, and eventually, they're going to drive each other insane. It's just destiny. That's just what happens. It's just a matter of time when you're locked in that car with the same person before you despise each other. Maybe that's too strong. Maybe it's not. But it's kind of sad how quickly the unity that two best friends have with one another, how quickly that gets lost. Unity is what Jesus is talking about here. And I have to consider that if his prayer that he prayed to God the Father the last night that he was with his disciples. If that prayer did not get answered, the prayer for unity, unity in believers, unity in the church, if that prayer wasn't answered, it's got to be up there with the greatest tragedies of the church of all time. It's got to be right up there with Adam and Eve, created perfectly in a perfect world, and then they still fell into sin. It would have to be up there with the fall of Jerusalem as God's people that he saved over and over and over again kept disobeying him and he finally said, fine, go into captivity. It would have to be up there with the kingdom when it was split, it was unified and then it was split because of the, dis the disobedience of one man. It was split into two kingdoms. It would have to be up there with the failures 
of the early church when Jesus sent them out and some of them still disobeyed him. Some of them still didn't believe, even after everything else. The day of ascension, Jesus went up to heaven and the Bible says, and some still doubted him. Those are some of the greatest failures in the history of the church. Has Jesus' prayer for unity in the church been answered? Because if it hasn't, if even Jesus' prayer wasn't answered, well, that would be terrible. And I think it probably seems to us that his prayer has not been answered, that there isn't unity in this church. There isn't unity in the churches throughout the world. As you drove this morning to this church, how many spires did you pass? How many houses of worship did you drive past before you got to this one? It seems there's a lack of unity in the church. And, there, and the problem, the problem about that, the reason why it's sort of inevitable is that the church, and this is going to be a surprise to you, the church is not just a building, the church is made up of people. Unfortunately, God's church is made of people, and people are sinful. And so some of these problems are more or less inevitable. Just think about one person for a moment. Because when Jesus is talking about unity here, he wants there to be unity between him and the Father and the Holy Spirit and that one individual Christian. Jesus was praying for you this day. This night when he was with his disciples, he was praying for you, specifically, you, individual person, lower to middle class lifestyle, living in this area in Wisconsin in this year with your life. He was praying specifically for you. Think about the unity that you have with God, the way that he has united you with himself. Through baptism, through God's word, he has caused you to be a believer through the different people that he has put in your life. And I suppose for the church to have perfect unity, it would take individuals that have perfect unity with Jesus. And I got to say, I feel like I'm looking at a bunch of sinners right now. Unity with God would mean every single time that God thinks something about something else, you would be thinking exactly the same thing. When God rebukes sin in an individual's life, at the same time, you would be thinking, yes, I agree with God. What God says is right, and what that person said is wrong. Within your own life, you would value the same things that Jesus values all the time, every single day. You would worship when God wants you to worship. You would pray whenever you, there is trouble, or you'd pray whenever you ought to give thanks to God. Reading God's word and worshiping together with other Christians would be the best part of your day, the best part of your week. You would have to value the same things that Jesus values. There would be no more of this, I feel like I did enough good to weigh out the bad. Because that's impossible. There's a lot of people who have the idea that I, if I do more good than bad, things will work out. But that's not perfect unity with Jesus. Jesus and his Father have been in perfect agreement since forever. When they decided to create the world, they weren't arguing about how it should be done. Nobody said the grass should be blue. They just knew grass is green, the sky is blue, clouds are white, roses are red, and so on. There wasn't disagreement there. When God said, let us make man in our own image, let us make man and woman, there was no disagreement there. Even in the plan of salvation, when God the Father decided to send his son there was no disagreement there. The Father said, this is a good idea. The Son said, this is a good idea. The Holy Spirit said, this is a good idea. It's really meaningful when we see Jesus in the garden praying to his Father. And Jesus saying, as a human, if there's a way that this doesn't have to happen like this, then let, then let it be changed. But even then, Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done. The Father and the Son have always been in perfect agreement, in perfect unity. And if you disagree with something that God says, 
then you're breaking that unity that you should be sharing with him. Every time you sin, you are breaking that unity. Theologians have said all sin is idolatry. In other words, every time you sin, you are choosing to value something else more than God. Maybe you're valuing another person. Maybe you're valuing your paycheck. You're valuing your pride. Whatever you're valuing, you're valuing something more than God. All sin is idol worship. Every time you sin, you break the unity that you ought to have with God. So if you wonder why the church is so messed up, why things have gone so badly, you have nowhere to look farther than yourself. Think about the damage that one person can do to the church, can spread rumors about people, can make up lies about someone, can ruin another Christian's reputation, can drive people apart. All because they chose to value things more than the unity that they were supposed to have with God. If you want the church to be better, maybe you ought to leave it. Because you are a sinner. You're going to go on sinning every day of your life. You're going to go on driving wedges between you and God and between you and other believers. If God wanted to make a perfect church, he really should not have chosen us. And yet he did. Yet he did choose us. And Jesus said something about his mission, something that he wanted to keep on doing. He recognizes these are not perfect people. Jesus said, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, that I myself may be in them. Jesus realized, I'm going to have to keep doing this over and over again. I have made you known to them. I'm going to continue to make you known to them. God tells us a lot of things over and over again. He tells us the same things repeatedly. You are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. I am your savior from sin. How many times did Jesus tell his disciples, I am going to suffer and die and come back to life. And in doing so, I'm going to forgive all of your sins. Everything wrong that you have ever done, I'm going to put it on myself. I'm going to put that weight on my shoulders. I'm going to die for you. And I'm going to come back to life so that you can know when you look at me, the way that I died, the way that I came back, that you're going to do the same. Jesus forgave the sins of his people, but he realized how weak they were. He realized that they would need to be told that over and over again. That's why in worship we use the same things over and over again. That's why we have forgiveness of sins in pretty much every service, where people confess their sins and they get told, you are forgiven. That's why we celebrate with Holy Communion. When people are told, once again, your sins are forgiven, we need to be told over and over again because we are sinful. We drive wedges between us and God, but God still keeps reaching out to us to bring us back, to forgive our sins, to restore that unity. And then he, he makes us a part of his church. He unites us together with other Christians, not just Christians who are here. Jesus is not talking about a visible church in these verses. He's not talking about St. James. He's talking about a bigger collection of believers than that. Does that mean? Does that mean that Jesus is talking about the southeastern district of the Wisconsin Synod? Now you've got to think bigger than that. Is Jesus talking about the entire wells? Jesus is going to unite the people in the Wisconsin Synod together with each other? Is that what he's talking about here? No, it's, it's even bigger than that. He's talking about uniting believers together with each other. That's what Jesus wants to do. That's what Jesus has done. His prayer from the Father did not go unanswered. But Jesus has united Christians together with the knowledge that Jesus is their Savior, their sins are forgiven through him, and that they will have eternal life in his name. That's what Jesus has done. 
He has brought unity. It doesn't really seem that way. When you look at all the different churches, all the different beliefs, but Jesus sees a different church. All we can see are the visible ones. We can see this one, the one over there, the 50 that are up the street that way. But Jesus sees the invisible church, the church that is made up of believers from all times and all places, people of different racial backgrounds, people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, some of the worst sinners that have ever walked the face of the earth but have been forgiven by Jesus, people who are tempted by greed, people who steal, people who commit all kinds of sexual sins, people who misuse God's name, people who tear down other Christians. Those people are all sinners. And yet God has chosen to make them a part of his church. He has united them together, something that should be impossible. And as Jesus was thinking about the church in the first century, it was going to be Jewish people, Roman people, people from different backgrounds, people that spoke different languages, people that dressed differently, people that worship differently. All those things are fine. But the thing that has to unite us together is our faith in Jesus. Should I talk about fellowship? Do you want to talk about that? I'm talking about unity, but I'm sure you're thinking, I'm not sure about this unity. Because Lutheran pastors have said for many years, we won't have that person come preach at our church because they teach different things. I won't pray with those people at that church because their church teaches different things. And there's some wisdom to that. Jesus talked about the way that he wanted people to be unified. He didn't say be united in some ways. He didn't say, you know what? These teachings are important. These ones are just, it's sort of a free-for-all. They don't really matter. Jesus was talking about the unity that he has with the Father. The same kind of unity that he wanted us to have with other Christians. The Father and the Son never disagreed. Not even once. That's the way that God wants us to be unified with other believers. That's the basic principle. Let's talk about a couple applications. Let's say somebody was a good Catholic. And I don't mean a good Christian, necessarily. Let's say somebody was a good Catholic. They believed everything that was in the Catholic catechism. They had been taught it. They did everything that the priest told them to do. Every single day, they went to Mass. They believed everything that the Catholic Church taught. They were a good Catholic, a practicing Catholic. That person would not be a good Christian. That person would be trusting in their own efforts to bring them salvation. Because in the catechism of the Catholic Church, they teach, God helps you part of the way, but you're on your own for the rest. I don't know what Catholics believe, not without talking to them. I cannot assume that any Catholic is a quote-unquote good Catholic. I'm concerned about the good Catholics. I'm concerned about people that put their trust in their own efforts instead of in Jesus. We're supposed to be united by our faith in Jesus. If you're putting your faith in something else, there is no salvation for you. So it would be wrong for us to take a priest from the Catholic Church who teaches all these things and let them preach in our pulpit, let them teach in our Bible classes, because we know what that person is going to teach. There are a lot of Catholics who are going to be in heaven. I mean a lot of Catholics. It's not because they're good Catholics, but it's because even as they exist in a sinful church, this one's sinful too, but even as they exist in a sinful church, they believe what the Bible says. They believe what the Bible says about Jesus as our Savior. And even though they're in a church that has some false teachings, they still trust in Jesus. If a Catholic asked me to pray with them, in private, one-on-one, -on -one, I probably would. Because you want to assume the best about a person that you reasonably can. If somebody went to a Baptist church, if somebody went to a non-denominational church, a Pentecostal church, I don't know what they believe. I know what their church teaches. I don't know what they believe. 
I'm going to assume the best that I reasonably can until they gave me reason to prove otherwise. But we're talking about unity in the church. God does not want there to be divisions among us, just like he is completely united with the Father. He wants us to be close, to have the same thoughts and words and deeds. And unfortunately, we will not perfectly achieve that. I wish we could, but the church is made up of people. The church has me in it. The church has you in it. And we are sinful. We do what is wrong. We break the unity that we have with God. And because of that, all sorts of problems are going to come. But Jesus continues to reach out to us, to restore that unity over and over and over again, to say, once again, I want you to know your sins are forgiven. You have eternal life in my name. You are united with all Christians from all time in Jesus. God the Father and God the Son are best friends. They have always agreed. They always will. But you and I, we're not best friends. We're pretty good friends. I like to think by now we're more than acquaintances. But we're not best friends. And even if we were, we would still disagree. We might not like the same kind of music. We might not wear the same clothing. We might have different ideas about the way that the church should be run. And even for your best friend, whoever it is, your spouse, your parents, your siblings, friend from high school, friend from college, you're going to have disagreements with them. You're not going to have perfect unity with that person. But you can have perfect unity with Jesus, not through your efforts, but through the continued effort of Jesus to reach out to you, to forgive you, to bring you back to him. You and I, as sinful as we are, have unity in Christ. Amen.